and strategic systems thinking and training concepts for kinetic lifestyles with your host Nathan Wakar talking about background knowledge to Boyd's Uda part one general systems theory Hey guys, this is Nathan Wagar with Borderland Strategic, and I'm going to be talking about Boyd's OODA Loop. Now, a lot of people address the OODA Loop by just tackling it directly and going over the OODA. I'm going to be doing something a little bit different, and the reason why is I see a lot of people, everyday people, instructors, all the way up to published articles in uh, academic journals, making the same mistake, and I think that the... (laughs) I really think that the problem is that they don't get a firm grasp of systems thinking, which is 90% of what Boyd was drawing from. He used systems thinking as the backbone, the structure of his concepts, and then he used other ideas like second law of thermodynamics, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and things like that to flesh out his ideas. And at Borderland Strategic, a lot of our focus is on applying systems thinking principles to uh, tactical discussions. And so what I'm going to be doing in this series of podcasts is I'm going to be working through the background knowledge that Boyd drew on to give you an idea of what UDA is and is not at every step of the way. And because systems thinking is so broad, I'm going to be working from the most general to the most abstract. So at the most general level, we have general systems theory. And then as you start working down, you start getting into cybernetics and control theory or complex adaptive systems. And then when you get even lower, you start applying those systems principles to specific organisms like people or uh, the tactical level or the strategic level. And at each level of these uh, systems concepts, I'm going to be showing you how UDA does and does not fit with that model. And then we'll start moving into some other cool stuff, like letting you see how UDA compares to other models, whether it really matters, how to adapt that to you. And uh, it'll be pretty cool. So with this particular lesson, I'm going to be talking about general systems theory and the idea of modeling systems to begin with because people sometimes get some of that stuff wrong right off the bat. The first concept that I want to talk about that is specific to Boyd is the idea of open and closed systems. So an open system is you have a system and it's set in an environment and there is input from the environment into the system, the process takes place, and then there's an output. A closed system is just something that exists and has no input or output. It just is. There aren't really closed systems in reality. Pretty much everything in reality is an open system because it's nested within other aspects of reality. So you've got an open system, you've got input, and you've got output. That usually forms a feedback loop, and you can already see the comparisons to UDA, which is working within an environment, and there's input and there's output. It's not too specific yet, so we're not going to be getting into anything close to UDA just yet. But for right now, just think of that system. You've got an input and you've got an output. Now, what Boyd was concerned about is the idea of closed systems and entropy. So he referred often to the second law of thermodynamics, and that that law can be formulated in a lot of different ways. But we're going to go with this one, which is the entropy of any closed system always tends to increase, and thus the nature of any given system is continuously changing, even as efforts are directed toward maintaining it in its original form. Now, Boyd didn't take a highly technical mathematical view toward entropy. He tended to view system entropy as being the same thing as system disorder. Now, all systems tend toward disorder. The difference is that open systems have the ability to import information. Information scientists would call it neg entropy, but they can import information from their environment to actually negate the entropy and maintain a kind of equilibrium. A closed system can't do that, and so it will always spiral in disorder until eventually the closed system will fail. The reason why this is important for Boyd's concept of the OODA loop is that a system has to be constantly in connection with its environment with both inputs and outputs. So the OODA loop can't be iterative, which means 
that it's happening in sequence. Some aspects of the OODA loop are always happening at all times because if any aspect of the OODA loop is cut off from its environment, then the system begins to die and it's already moving towards system failure. In systems terms, we would say that it's, it's oscillating until it eventually goes into system collapse. So just right there with that simple concept from general systems theory of open versus closed systems, you can see how this concept of a cycling OODA loop that happens in succession, O-O-D-A, O-O-D-A, is incorrect. The idea of open systems is that there's constant input and output that's happening from many different parts of the system. It's always rooted in it, in its environment. And there are some aspects of the system that are happening at all times. And the second that you turn into a closed system, Boyd believed, you begin to die. So UDA is this continuous process and all aspects of it are happening at all times. So we'll come back to that later in other podcasts. But that's the first key point. The second key group of ideas is that of hierarchy, levels, and time skills. This gets a little bit into stuff from complex adaptive systems rather than just specifically general systems theory. So I'm going to save this for more in-depth on a later podcast. But the general idea is that systems are always nested in their environment, which form other systems. And so we have macro-level systems, and they have systems inside them that are meso-level systems. And then they have systems that are micro-level systems. And these different levels exist at different time scales. You can see this in the military. A division-level movement moves more slowly on the macro than a battalion-level movement on the meso or on a company or platoon-level movement on the micro. Systems also can be more static or dynamic before a critical event. So several hours before an event is considered more static or less compressed than several minutes or seconds before an event. And so the rules for one system level don't always transfer to another. You can see this in the idea of Uda as a speed looping. So it's all about speed. But the thing is, is that Boyd started out applying it at the tactical level. And at the tactical level is a micro level of analysis. And so speed is going to play more of a part because of the compressed space time. That doesn't, however, mean that speed is as much of a focus at all levels. And it's not even a complete focus at the micro level. And so that brings us to the third main point, which is that of system of inquiry. And a system of inquiry is important because UDA is designed to move across the entire system of inquiry. The thing is, is when you're analyzing a system, a system often consists of other systems and multiple levels within the system. So if my system of inquiry is a battalion, then yeah, there are companies and there are platoons and there are teams and squads within that battalion that are taking part in UDA. But UDA is only being completed as an entire cycle at the level of the system of inquiry. And that's really important. A system of inquiry can cut across horizontally, across multiple units of the same size, but it can also cross uh, vertically over different time scales and levels. This idea of levels is super important because this is what people mess up all the time. It's what's not really known is that Boyd never applied UDA at anything lower than the tactical level. This is even when he applied it to the example of Korean fighter pilots. He wasn't applying it to the individual pilots. They were taking part in UDA, but the larger system of inquiry includes the pilots. It, it includes mission control. It includes the formation itself. And that whole system of inquiry of all the fighter pilots within their formation with command and control, that system of inquiry is what's conducting UDA, not the individual planes. And that's something that a lot of people misunderstand. So system of inquiry, levels, hierarchy, time scales, all these things are super important. Which brings us to our fourth point, and that's the idea of modeling systems in general. Now, models are one of those things that People implicitly understand we all use them. Our mind makes models every time we try to grasp new concepts, but we tend to confuse or misapply them. A lot of this happens when we're trying to use the wrong level model for the wrong activity or to describe the wrong thing. So there's always going to be a trade-off between accuracy and clarity. The more down in the dirt and nitty gritty that you get with a model, the more details you add. The problem is that there's too many details to be functional and it's too cluttered. 
So someone could ask me for a model of my home, and a lot of things go into the concept of my home. There's the front yard, there's the backyard, there's the home itself, there's the garage, there's the uh, driveway and the area around it. All of these things are the macro level, and so my home on the macro level consists of many subsystems and sublevels. On the meso, maybe there's the individual rooms and things inside it. I could get lower and lower and start including furniture. I could go even lower and then start include including the details like that dirty sock over there, that kettlebell, or my dog's uh, Angry Bird squeaky toy that's over there underneath the uh, the television set. Now, I could do all that. I could add all those tiny micro-level details, but usually when someone asks for a macro-level model, it's for a generic purpose, and so those small details clutter up the purpose of the model. Small-level details are also really changeable, so the number of rooms in my house isn't likely to change, and so that forms a fixed part of the model, but if I model too many micro-elements like the toys and stuff in the house... Well, does that mean that no other type of toy will ever be in my house? No, it doesn't. So they're not an essential part of the model. Now, how does this apply to UDA? Well, a lot of the criticisms towards UDA are usually by people that are applying UDA at the wrong level. Sometimes they'll say things like, well, UDA is too broad to be useful. And fair enough, but that's usually by people that are applying UDA at too low of a level, at a micro or even a meso level. And the funny thing is, is that's not what Boyd thought about UDA himself. In fact, in the words that he wrote in the notes of his own research in the 70s, he called it a meta paradigm in a theory of intellectual evolution and growth. And a meta model is a model of other models. So... And a highly abstract meta model is going to be simple because it can't say too much because if it acknowledges things at a lower level, then it locks out other things. And so it has to have all these things under its umbrella, all these subsystems. So people that are saying that UDA is too broad to be useful, well, that depends on the instructor. UDA takes into account, or it takes for granted rather, that there are many other systems underneath it. And that implies a whole broad uh, array of knowledge that Boyd had. A lot of instructors don't. And so, frankly, they shouldn't be even trying to apply UDA as a whole, or they should be applying a certain sub-aspect of UDA that fits more with their specialty on the micro. But often the complaints that I hear against UDA usually have to do with misapplying what is by Boyd's own words, a meta model or a meta paradigm, and they're trying to apply it too low on the ground, so to speak. So yeah, you have to fill in a lot of the blanks, and those blanks aren't part of the model, but they were never meant to be. So that's that's one criticism dealt with. A second criticism of UDA is related to the first one in that it's about misapplying levels of models, but it accuses Boyd of this. Basically, it's based on the idea that Boyd took a micro-level situation with the uh, fighter pilots that he abstracted a micro-level, what should have been a micro-level model from those fighter pilots, and then he misapplied it to meso and macro-level things. So he tried to take a small model that worked with fighter pilots and then apply it to things like all of combat, whether it's a battalion or a brigade or business organizations. And this isn't something that just anybody says uh, this is something that you can see in uh, peer-reviewed journals so if i pull up let's find this one this one is uh uda versus asda metaphors at war by justin kelly and mike brennan and quote for the purposes of describing contemporary conflict the weaknesses of the Boyd cycle lie in its origins. It grew from the observation of the specific case of aerial combat in Korea and has been extended to cover all of war, conflict, business, and librarianship. The process of arguing from the specific to the general is induction. In formal logic, this is fallacious, but more importantly, the further the argument is removed from its original context, the more it relies on additions and elaborations to make sense of it. Used to describe one-on-one -on -one aerial combat, the Boyd cycle is a reasonable summary of the most important dynamics, but applied to Kirk, Kapyong, Ted, or Baghdad, it becomes progressively less directly applicable without qualification or adornment. End quote. Now, I think that's fucking retarded, and for a few different reasons. 
My first issue is with the often repeated statement that Boyd got this from aerial combat in Korea. Uh, That would be like saying that me, because I coach boxing, among other things, and if I were to write a book about hand-to-hand combat, that I took that micro-level example of boxing, made a micro-level model about boxing, and then tried to apply it to hand-to-hand combat, and so it's invalid, when the reality is that boxing is one of many things that I coach, and that I made a meta-level model, and then I applied it to boxing along with a bunch of other things, and because it was always meant to be a meta-level model, that it worked out. And that's exactly what Boyd did. And the people that wrote this paper should know better because they cited Franz Osinga, who is pretty much the gold standard on Boyd's work and brought it back to the forefront in about, I believe it was 2007, and he's done articles since then. And Franz Osinga noted that quote that I gave earlier about Boyd viewing it as a meta paradigm, but this was before he had even formally started teaching the concept of Uda as anything at all. So it was already fully fledged and made a paradigm. And you could also only say that or think that, that he committed induction if you ignored the entire other body of Boyd's work. In his A New Conception of Air-to-Air Combat that was written in August of 1976, he still hadn't even mentioned Uda yet. And even within that example, he talked about Israeli raids and Blitzkrieg alongside air-to-air combat. So that just disproves this idea that he teased this micro-level model off of just that micro-level situation of air-to-air combat. It didn't happen like that. He always had in mind for it to be a mated paradigm. He applied it at the micro-level, and then he applied it at other levels too. And he did it that same year in Patterns of Conflict. He covered all kinds of historical battles and applied Uda with the same concepts using this huge bibliography where he relied on everything from chaos theory to uh, complex adaptive systems to, yes, logic, induction, and deduction. And I have to take a little bit of a dig at that because this was submitted, this article citation in the uh, Australian Army Journal And they chose the ASDA, the uh, act, sense, decide, adapt loop over the UDA. And so the authors are from that continent. And so they have that uh, bias towards their own loop. And they're trying to, you know, argue against the use of the UDA loop. And, you know, fine. But if you're going to so blatantly misrepresent Boyd's work and then cite authors that, totally disprove your entire thesis it just looks like sloppy research to me and then you know just as a final note it's actually not a formal logical fallacy to argue from part to whole it's an informal fallacy it can be true but there's no way to prove it deductively and so that's why it's often called illicit transfer fallacy or sometimes a fallacy of composition depending on how it's uh, structured in the argument but it's just a way to sound smart and uh boyd Definitely knew what induction and deduction is, so it just seemed like a cheap shot. But that's a good example of how people accuse Boyd's model of being inappropriate for a given level or inapplicable because he drew it from something that doesn't apply to the macro. Uh, It is a meta-level paradigm. It does apply to the micro, and it does apply to the macro. And I'll even take that a bit further. It wouldn't make sense to go with the common, at this point, it's practically an old wives' tale because everybody repeats it. And I think it's because the same papers kept citing the same papers for so long until Franz Osinga's uh, work on Boyd's ideas came out. This idea that uh, he got Uda specifically from Korean aerial combat, I don't know how you would come to that idea by looking at Uda because... Like all models, Uda leaves a lot of things out, and Uda is not particularly specific to aerial combat. Like, if you were going to make a model based on aerial combat and how fighters win in aerial combat, you would not just set, have observe, orient, decide, and act. That's way too generic. So, to put it simply, a micro level model that talked about how fighter pilots win in aerial combat wouldn't look like Uda. 
It would have to be more specific. There would have to be at least something that is specific to aerial combat. It would have to look like a micro model. It doesn't because it never was. So as a recap, we've looked at uh, open versus closed systems and the second law of thermodynamics. We've looked at hierarchy, levels, and time scales from macro to meso to micro. We've looked at the idea of a system of inquiry and how that fits in with UDA and across time scales. And we've talked about the idea of models and how high-level models, meta-level models are models of models. They have to take a lot of things into account and can't be too specific, so they have to be very generic. And as you get down to applying a model at the micro level, you have to add more things and it becomes more complex. And then you have to worry about clutter and how... UDA was always meant to be a meta level model. And if you're going to apply it at the micro level, then you have to have a lot of experience because UDA covers a lot of other subsystems. And so if that isn't your area of expertise, then you're not going to be using or applying all of UDA. You're going to be using a very small subsection of it. Finally, models are either descriptive or prescriptive or normative. So descriptive models just tell how something is. A normative model tells how you should do something. UDA is a descriptive model, and this is where a lot of instructors mess up because they try to tell you that they're going to improve your decision making, and then they teach you UDA. That doesn't help your decision making. That is how you do decision making, among other things. It's more than just a decision making model. But they act like teaching you the model itself is somehow making you better at it, and it's not. That's just... Uh, it's kind of like research porn. A lot of instructors do it. You know, I, I've had to work on it myself where it's like you want to cram in so much cool information because it's cool, but it doesn't actually help your clients do anything any better. You know, if I'm teaching people in the military or protection UDA concepts, how I apply that is completely different than just teaching them UDA. Just teaching them UDA doesn't tell them anything because it's a descriptive model. To use a chess analogy, I could teach you... The rules of chess, I can teach you how the different pieces move, but that doesn't teach you how to play chess. It doesn't teach you the strategy of moving the pieces and how to actually win at games of chess. Okay. Now, on the flip side, that also doesn't mean that modeling things out with UDA is completely uh, useless either. Because it gives me a lay of the land, it gives me that map, and now I decide where to go. You know, it gives me the rules of the game, and it shows me how the chess pieces move, and now I have all that mapped out, and I can start actually tinkering with lever points to get better at the process. That's all possible, but you have to be aware of that, and it takes an extensive skill set. And sometimes even if you have the skill set, it's going to be above your pay grade, sort of like when you're considering a system of inquiry that's a platoon. You know, if you're lower on that level, you're not going to be doing all of UDA because that's not in your mission parameters. So it's just something to take into account. So that's the last point that we're going to cover today is the idea of uh, descriptive versus normative and how that leads to a lot of misunderstandings with UDA. So that's the podcast for today. We covered the general systems theory. Then we're going to move into the more specific complex adaptive systems and cybernetics and how that's influenced UDA. And hopefully we'll really tighten in your understanding of Boyd's model. Until then, train hard, stay safe, have fun.